Well, thank God for joining me on this evening on our faith and deliverance service for our Bible study for on this blessed day that we're here to share the word of God. As others will be coming in and joining us, I want to just thank God for this opportunity just to come to share his word on this evening on what we call our faith and deliverance night, our faith and deliverance service going into our Bible study as well. And on tonight, I have a tremendous word to share with you, not to sound redundant or repetitive. When I come before you with the word of the Lord, I'm always excited about what God has shared with me to share with you, because I know when God gives a word, it is for a meaningful purpose to find you exactly where you are in life and to make a difference in your life. I just believe the word of God is that powerful, that when the word of God goes forth, I just believe that believers will be encouraged, that sinners will be saved and backsliders reclaimed. I believe that sick bodies will be healed. I believe that broken hearts will be mended back together. I believe that problems will be solved. And I just believe whatever is troubling you, when you embrace the word of God, I may not be able to tell you when, but I will be able to say this. Sooner or later, God is going to bring you out and bring you through. So thank you for joining us on tonight. I'm going to ask, as always, that you begin to like, begin to share, begin to tag, begin to have your watch party, because it helps us to continue the gospel of Jesus Christ. It helps to touch others that they may be blessed as well to receive this word on, to, on today or even to view it later. I want to thank God for my lovely wife, uh, Lady Paula Griffin Roth, who's viewing as well. We thank God for her love and her prayers and support. I thank God for the love and prayers and support of you, God's people, for the members of Greater St. Mark, for well-wishers around the country. Uh, I am just overwhelmed with joy and delight when people around the country begin to view and to share uh, some I've never met before and some are family members. I thank God for them. I thank God for everyone, whatever you do, great or small, regarding what our efforts are and how they mean and what they mean to you. As you know, you can be supportive of the ministry beyond your prayers, but with your financial support, with your tithe and your offerings by sowing into this good ground. And feel free to mail them in to Greater St. Mark, Church of God in Christ, P.O. Box 19, Memphis, Tennessee, 38101. Also, feel free to use the Gillify app. And there you will find us as Greater St. Mark, Church of God in Christ. And also on Cash App. And there you will find us with the dollar sign. Uh, greater ST Mark Koji, and that's C O G I C. So you have those means available for you to sow into this good ground. Tonight, I want to make a special note of what I'm going to do on tonight because tonight I want it to be uh, forever embedded in your mind and in your heart. That's why it's so important for you to like and to share and to tag. So you can always go back and reference the word of God, because I just believe this, my sisters and my brothers, when the word of God goes forth under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and when the word of God is sent forth specifically by God himself, uh, I just have no doubt that that word becomes timeless. What I mean by timeless, no matter where you are now or where you have been or where you may be going, you can reflect back on that word. And that word is not archaic. It is not antiquated. It becomes timeless because it can speak to you even then as it does now. So wherever you are and whatever you may be uh, dealing with in life, the word of God has no expiration date on it when it comes to helping you as a believer. I want you to understand that when we read uh, biblical accounts in God's word, and we know that they happened hundreds of years ago, that that was during Bible days and Bible times. And we read about individuals and how God moved in their lives. I want you to know that that same God, that same Holy Ghost power is available to us as believers. 
His word does not have an expiration date. It does not lose its power. It does not go out of date as uh, something on the shelf that has an expiration date. God's word is everlasting. He said that heaven and earth would pass away before one dot or tittle of his word would pass away. So that means we can always count on God's word to be there for us. So I thank God for his word being timeless. It is always there for us, regardless of where you may be in life. You can refer back to God's word. And I can assure you that the answer to your problems will be in God's word. All we have to do is make ourselves available, believe, and apply ourselves to God's word. Well, on tonight, I want to dedicate this word to you on tonight. I want to dedicate it to those who are going through. I want to dedicate it to those who feel like you're stuck where you are. And I know all of us have been having challenges throughout the course of this year. And it seems like if it's not one thing, it's another. But on tonight, I want to dedicate this word to those who seems like the struggle has become ongoing and has become a cycle. It seems like when you uh, come out of one problem, another one is facing you. It seems like when you even out of, out of that problem, it seems like it's just continuous, it's perpetual. But I want you to know, on tonight, I dedicate this word to you. I dedicate this message to you. I dedicate this sermon to you. I dedicate this word as a rhema word to you that it would be timeless in your life. And whether you have challenges or struggles or not, I want you to make note that you can refer back to this even at a later time because it will be of significance to you at some point in your life. Well, why and how do I know that? Because the Bible says that they that live godly shall suffer persecution. You don't have to look for trouble. Trouble will come your way. You don't have to look for sickness. It will come your way. You don't have to look for burdens. They will come your way. So this word on tonight is dedicated to you that wherever you are in the course of life, whatever moment you're in, whatever challenges you face, whatever sickness, whatever boundaries that have you where you feel like you can't get out of it, tonight is your night to receive this rhema word that God will reveal to you on tonight. Well, let's get into this word that I'm excited about because it's dedicated to you and it's dedicated to your deliverance. It's dedicated to your healing. It's dedicated for your miracle. It's dedicated for your salvation. It's dedicated for whatever you need from God. I dedicate this word to you. Well, on tonight, I want to draw your attention to the epistle of Peter, and that is 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. And feel free to type that in, to write it in, so others, when they come in, they will know where we are in the word of the Lord. I know I have it under the caption, but also you can type that in as well. Again, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. And as always, when something is said, when something is mentioned, when something registers with you, be sure to type in your amens, your hallelujahs, your praise God, your thank you, Jesus, so that I know that this word is being beneficial to you. And I have no doubt that it will be. So 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse 12 and concluding with verse 13 from the King James Version of the Bible. It reads, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Oh, that's a good place just to rejoice and shout right there, to know that when his glory shall be revealed, that we will have and be glad with exceeding joy. But I want to go back to verse 12 again. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing that happened unto you. Well, on tonight, on this evening, for the moments that we're going to share together, I want to talk to you about it's only a test. It's only a test. Well, what is a test? It is basically a process of evaluation to determine a level of ability 
and readiness to move to the next level. It is also confirmation. It is also an investigation. It is an, it's an exam. Uh, it can be a final. It can be a quiz. It can be a questionnaire. It can even be an experiment. Tonight is not my intent to go into all the different types of tests, and I'm sure you know what they are. You know how you can have a final exam, a midterm. You can have even an interest exam. You can have a qualifying exam. You can have a quiz. You can have an open book test. Tests take on a variety of ways. You have multiple choice. You have true and false. You have fill in the blank. You have uh, uh, exam. Uh, you have the narrative. Uh, you have all different types of tests. But regardless of that type of test, I want you to know, even in your life right now, what you're dealing with is only a test. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're faced with, remember, it's only a test. I can hear in my spirit, some are probably saying, but preacher, you don't understand this trial. My problems are severe, tough and like nothing else I've ever had to deal with. But wait a minute, child of God, hear what God is saying. Listen to what he's saying to us through his word. It's only a test. Uh, the emergency broadcast system from time to time would send a message and they would start by saying this is only a test. If this were actually an emergency, you would have been instructed to seek immediate shelter. So they're notifying you that it is only a test. Well, for those who feel as if your situation is an emergency, hear the word of the Lord. What he says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. In other words, you have a place of safety even when that test seems unbearable. But again, it's only a test. Look at what James records in James chapter one, verses two through four. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. All what you're going through, just have patience. Be willing to wait on God. And I know a lot of times we say we're waiting on God, but there are times that God is actually waiting on us. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, is recorded. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Sometimes that test, it is designed to bring us closer to God, even now what we're dealing with in this world. If you are not closer to God right now, I don't know what it would take to bring you closer to God. When we're dealing with sickness and we're dealing with death, and we're dealing with financial issues, we're dealing with hardships, dealing with layoffs, we're dealing with uncertainty. If this does not draw you closer to God, I don't know what will. But bear in mind, it's only a test. Are you saying, brother, preacher, the entire world can have a test at one time? Yes, it can. Because the, the word of the Lord says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell therein. Well, when you think about a test, you think about why me? I want to say, why not you? Uh, we have not been so good that we are above uh, going through things in life. So you may say, why you? Well, why not you? Well, I want you to know whether it's educational, professional, an association, or medical reason, or physical, or spiritual, or personal, and natural. There's always some type of test. Well, number one, why? What is the purpose of a test? Well, number one is to determine what you know. That's number one. The purpose of a test is to determine what you know. In other words, your knowledge. The test will test. It will examine your knowledge. That's number one. Then number two, the second thing, to determine if you are ready for the next level. So are you ready? The test determines that. Uh, to determine if you are ready for 
the next level. We don't know what that next level may be, but the test would help to determine, are you ready for the next level? So ask yourself, are you ready? Then the third thing, what is your current situation? Where are you? A test determines, where are you in this? So it determines that. So you have those three things about the purpose of a test. Then what comes to mind, what gives Peter the inspiration to tell the saints? Think it not strange of what you are going through. Well, he had, Peter was handpicked by the Lord. So I believe he has the qualifications. He has the background, the experience to leave this on record to let us know, to think it not strange concerning what we are going through. But Peter was chosen as a disciple by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto them, unto him who he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sickness, and to cast out devils. And then verse 16 in Mark chapter 3 states, And Simon he surnamed Peter. So he was called by the Lord Jesus Christ to be a disciple and given the power to do the will of the Lord. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, was included in the inner circle that followed Jesus into private moments, along with James and John, when the other nine would remain behind. Jesus would take Peter, James, and John. Look at what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was there that Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Look at what happened in the house of Jairus. It was inside the house that Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Look at what happened on the night of his betrayal. When Jesus went into the garden to pray, he took with him in the inner garden, in the garden of Gethsemane. He took with him into the inner garden, Peter, James, and John, and asked him to pray while he was beckoning unto God and to the Holy Spirit to give him strength. But Peter was led of the Lord and led to the Lord by his brother Andrew. But God used him mightily. So Peter has the qualifications and the experience to leave on record to let us know that it's only a test. In John chapter 1, verses 40 through 42, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So Jesus now readily embraces Peter, which was Simon, to be one of his chosen 12, to be a disciple, to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, let's look at this revelation that the father gave Peter regarding Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13 and concluding down through verse 20, when Jesus came into the coast, of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, which is Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Look at what Jesus said to Simon Peter. After Simon Peter acknowledged who Jesus was, Jesus said in verse 17, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 
Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So in other words, he's given power now to believers that we can bind things in the earth. And when we bind them in the earth, they will be bound in heaven. When we loose them in the earth, they will be loosed in heaven. So when it's only a test, we can bind the things that are troubling us. And you bind it by the authority of Jesus Christ. You bind it by the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And when you bind it in the earth, it'll be bound in heaven. And when you begin to loose things in the earth, loose health, loose strength, loose prosperity, loose whatever you need from God. When you loose it in the earth, God will loose it in the heavens. Well, the Catholic Church, they took the position that Peter should be the first pope of the church based on our Lord's words here. But Jesus was not building the church on Peter, but on the prophetic words revealed and spoken by Peter. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You have to understand that Peter was known for being short-tempered. He was known for packing a weapon, a sword at times. And although he was a fisherman, Peter didn't mind being a little outspoken at times. But thanks be unto God, God uses ordinary people just like you and just like me. It was Peter on that Pentecostal experience that ushered in a prominent place in the faith. For it was Peter that stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached and 3,000 souls were added to the church. See how God can take us even in our shortcomings, in in our, even in our frailties, even in our lack, even where we are not measuring up to his standards, yet God can take us and use us. Why? Because it's only a test. Look at here in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing that it is about the third hour of the day. In other words, it was only 9 a.m. in the morning. And verse 16 says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old, your old men shall dream dreams. In other words, Peter now is standing up and preaching the word of God on the day of Pentecost. And the Lord God added 3,000 souls to the church for this man preaching the word of God. Well, just as Peter was handpicked by the Lord, consider the fact that you've been handpicked by the Lord. No, I'm not talking about predestination. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So when you embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have been handpicked. How? Because he loved the world. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 10 through 11, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And verse 11 says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. When you realize it's only a test, you realize that our only help, our only resolve to this matter, our only way of coming out of this matter is through the help of the Lord God himself. That's why I'm saying it's only a test. If Peter were here today, he would stand and remind the church Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, it's only a test. Others would stand with Peter and testify to the goodness of God. When Peter stood up, the other 11 stood up with him. And I believe as believers in Jesus Christ, we should stand up right now. Stand up in our faith and realize that God is on our side and realize what we're going through, what we're wrestling with, what we're struggling with, that it's only a test. Look at what Job said. In Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. 
And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence cometh thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him? In the earth a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, That Job fear not God for naught, has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he had on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Put forth thy hand now, touch all that he had and he will curse thee to thy face. And look what verse 12 says in Job chapter one, verse 12. It says, and the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself, but not forth thou hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. In the words, the devil had to receive permission from God, even to test Job. And I want you to know that whatever you're going through in life, it is not a surprise to God. It is not of God. God is not doing it. It is of the devil. But consider this. Consider the fact that God is boasting on you, that God is so pleased with you that even the devil has to receive permission from God to do anything to you. And I want you to know that the devil is trespassing on God's property, but it's only a test. In Job chapter 14, verse one, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Job 23 and 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. Even when he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job is saying he realized it's only a test. Job 23 and 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. And when he tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He's saying that when I come through this trial, when I come through this test, I will come forth as gold. The psalmist said in Psalms 118 verses 5 through 6. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. I will not even fear what life can do unto me. Why? Because the psalmist said that in my distress, the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. And I want you to know, even in your distress, even in your tests, that the Lord is on your side. You don't have to fear. You don't have to worry about it because God uh, is on your side. The Bible says in Psalms 71 and 12, O God, be not far from me. O God, make haste for my help. Some say that you can't hurry God. Yes, you can. The psalmist said in Psalms 71 and 12, O God, again, be not far from me. Oh my God, make haste. In the words, get in a hurry and come and help me. I want you to know that it's bad theology. It's kitchen table theology. When you believe that you can't hurry God, that's not biblical or correct according to his word. Don't allow tradition to determine your doctrine or faith in God. I want you to understand that when you pray that God can and will get in a hurry. Think about Daniel in the den of lions. I'm glad that God got in a hurry or it would have been bad for Daniel. He would have been a lion's dinner, but God got in a hurry. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fiery furnace. I'm glad God got in a hurry or it would have been Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of them in that fiery furnace. The Bible says in Psalms 46 and 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And the present means right then and right now. Oh, don't tell me God won't get in a hurry. Yes, he will. The Bible says in Psalms 30 and the fifth verse and the B clause, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Look at what this psalmist said in Psalms 34, verses 17 through 19. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth them and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that of a broken heart and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. Hear what the songwriter says. 
The songwriter said, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Then a little light from heaven filled my soul, bathed my heart in love, and well, it wrote my name above. Just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. The other verse says, now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry and answer by and by. Now when you feel a prayer wheel turning, then you'll know a little fire is burning. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. In other words, it's only a test. The psalmist says in Psalms 119 and 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted but I might learn thy statutes. In other words, whatever you're going through, is going, you're going through it to learn and teach you more about the power of God. You're learning more about how he's able to save, how he's able to heal, how he's able to deliver. Look at what the writer said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Look at what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 2. He says, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. And then verse two says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. In other words, the chest is not to destroy you, but the chest will strengthen your faith. Look at what the psalmist says. In Psalms 27, and I got to hurry on and finish this. In Psalms 27, verses 1 through 6, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumble and fail. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart should not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be comforted. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I may seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. In other words, it's only a test. In Psalm 27 again, verses 13 through 14, it says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good cheer, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Well, what am I waiting on, brother preacher? You're waiting on God to bring you out of this test. You're waiting on God to turn it around for you. You're waiting on God to turn it over for you because it's only a test. Look at what Andre Crouch said in the song through it all. He said, I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come to make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend on the, his word. In other words, through everything I've been through, it teaches me that it's only a test. Well, Peter reminds us of this in his epistle to encourage the believer, to encourage us to rejoice and live above reproach. It is that we know that Peter believed in Jesus Christ. He's encouraging us to believe in the Lord also. And the Bible lets us know in 1 Peter 
chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, you don't have to wait till the trial is over. You don't have to wait till the test is over. You can give God praise right now. You can give God glory right now, knowing that it's only a test because First Peter 4, 12 and 13 again says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. In other words, it's intense. In other words, it seems like it's harder than anything I've ever gone through. But he said, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. I want you to know that you have other witnesses that would tell you that if it had not been for the Lord on their side, if it had not been for God on their side, they don't know what they would have done. But don't think it's strange concerning this that has happened unto you, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. And I want you to know that God's glory will be revealed in your life. God's glory will be revealed in your sickness. God's glory will be revealed in your trial because when God shows up, his glory is there. His anointing is there. His power is there. His miracles are there. His healing is there. When God shows up, his glory shall be revealed. And the Bible says, as I leave you now, in Matthew chapter 5, there verse 10 through 12, it says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. But here it is, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which are before you. In other words, it's only a test. What you're going through, this trial, this burden, the sickness, whatever it is, I want you to know that God will give you the victory to come out of that trial, to come out of that sickness, to come out of what is troubling you. And as I leave you now, remember, join us again on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. and I'm back again on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Feel free to sow into this ministry. Greater St. Mark, Church of God in Christ. P.O. Box 19, Memphis, Tennessee, 3101. And on Gillify, Greater S.T. Mark, Church of God in Christ. And on Cash Out, the dollar sign, Greater S.T. Mark Koji. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that whatever test you're going through, that you will remember this, and I dedicate this to you, that you're going to know that it's only, it's only a test. It's only a test. It's only a test. This is an oldie, but it's a goodie. It's only a test. Remember that. Yes, whatever you're going through, it's only a test that you're going through. <laughs> it's going to be over real soon. I don't know when, but one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Because it's only a test. Yes. <laughs> it's only a test that you're going through. It's going to be over. As I told you, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Not necessarily in the end, but whenever God shows up. Yes, hallelujah. It's only a test that you're going through. It's not going to last always. <laughs> yes. It's coming to make you strong. Yes, hallelujah. Yeah. Be strong. Keep the faith. <laughs> it's only a test. God bless you. Until my next time. It's only a test you're going through. I'm praying for you. Lady Roth is praying, praying for you. The blessings of the Lord be upon you. And we bless you in the name of the Lord. And remember, it's only it's a test. God bless you.